We are in the midst of a series of studies on the men of, of the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, we've, I've been enjoying this. I don't know if anybody else has, but I've been enjoying this series of studies. And we've talked about several different ones. We've talked about the, the, the family of the Herods. We've talked about the four fishermen. We've, we've talked about Matthew himself. We've talked about a centurion who had incredible faith. And, and tonight we are, uh, we're, gonna, we're not really, we're not going to be talking about one individual. We're going to be talking about a group of men. And we're going to be looking at a contrast that we'll find in chapters 9 through 12 of Matthew. And the contrast is between Jesus and his adversaries, the Pharisees. Because when you start talking about the men of Matthew, we're not looking at just the good examples. But you know what? The Bible puts the bad examples in there as well, too. And we learn a lot from those as well. And so, uh, in fact, one week we'll probably even look at Judas Iscariot, um, and doesn't get much worse than that. But, uh, but we're, we're going to be looking at the Pharisees tonight, and we're going to be looking at the contrast between the ministry of Jesus and the Pharisees and their actions and their ministry. And, and it's a contrast that still exists in the church and in the world today. So turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 9. We're going to read verses 1 through 8. Uh, and we're going to be discussing, discussing uh, portions of the next three chapters, but we're going to begin in verse, uh, or excuse me, in chapter 9 in verse 1. And uh, uh, let's just read it together. Matthew chapter 9, verse 1. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do, you, why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk. Now I want to mention here, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. It's not easier to do, but it's easier to say because I can say that and there's no physical evidence that backs up that, that it actually happened. Nobody can see what happened inside of your heart. So Jesus is saying, which is easier to say? To, your sins are forgiven or, your, or, or rise and walk? And the answer is it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because if you say rise and walk and they don't, they don't rise and walk, then it's obvious in that moment. So, so he asked them that question. And then in verse 6 he says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. In other words, he said, so that you'll know that when I say your sins are forgiven, it really happens. I'm going to say the hard thing to you. And, and when it happens, you'll know I have the same authority. So he says, uh, but, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid and they glorified God who had given such authority to men. Now, the contrast that we see here in chapters 9 through 12, and as you read through the, the next three chapters, you, you'll see this over and over and over and over again. That You'll see a contrast between Jesus' healing and the Pharisees acting, as it were, in opposition to the very essence of Jesus' ministry. For example, let's just begin with these first eight verses. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, you see Jesus ministering comfort and grace. Uh, look, look at what he says. Uh, Jesus has this ministry of comfort and grace. Verse 2, And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son. So he's, al he's already comforting him. That's the ministry of comfort. And then you begin to see, you see the ministry of grace. Because then he says, Your sins are forgiven. Furthermore, we see the ministry of discernment, the, this, the, the discernment of spirits. Look at verse 4. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, that is the, the judgmental thoughts of the scribes and the Pharisees that, that, uh, that, that were sitting around him. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your, in your hearts? He, he was ministering in the power of the, of the New Testament gift of discernment. He, he was able to discern that they were having evil and judgmental thoughts in their hearts. Th then he ministers the gift of healing by raising the man up from the bed of affliction. So we have comfort, grace, discernment, and healing 
in the ministry of Jesus. Now, what about the Pharisees who watched him? The actions of the Pharisees, you, you see these things. You see accusation. Verse 3, and behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, this man is blaspheming. They're, they're bringing accusation against Jesus. Secondly, instead of grace, they bring law. Listen, they do not want that the man to be forgiven. The fact of the matter is that they're, they're not angry just because Jesus works a miracle. They're angry because the man gets healed at all. Now, now you, you have to understand the mindset of these legalistic Pharisees. They saw affliction and sickness, any, any physical disorder. They saw that as the manifest evidence of sin. For them, the, the world was made up of people who were well and righteous and those who were sick and unholy. Therefore, they did not want people to be healed. They, they liked to see that clear distinction in their mind between those people who are wicked and those of us who are, who are, who are righteous and, and therefore not sick. To them, it, to them, it was obvious that they were suffering for their sins. Uh, they, they liked that. They actually enjoyed that because it made them feel better about themselves. So when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, they, they didn't want his sins forgiven. They liked him suffering for his sins. Furthermore, whereas Jesus' ministry was a ministry of healing, their ministry was a ministry of destruction. They, they wanted the man confined. They, they were perfectly willing. They, they had no compassion at all for his suffering, nor for his family, nor for his parents. They had no concern at all for his healing or for restoration in his life. The, 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 their, theirs was a ministry of destruction. So you see straight away in this very first passage, in the opening verses of the ninth chapter, the contrast, the contradiction between the two. Comfort, grace, discerning, and healing in Jesus, and accusation, law, judgment, no discernment. I mean, when these Pharisees could, could not even discern Jesus, who he was, when they see him forgiving sin and performing healing miracles. And, and then they had destruction. So comfort and accusation. Grace, law, discernment, no discernment. Healing, destruction. Now let's look at verses 9 and 10. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. Now, we looked at this passage last week when we studied Matthew, the, the author of the book. Now let's look at it from a, from a different viewpoint. Uh, now let's look at it with Matthew not as the center, but Jesus at the center. And let's see the contrast between Jesus and the ministry of the Pharisees around them. So first of all, Jesus' ministry. Jesus' Jesus' ministry has about it the power and the ability to convert. He, he utters a simple sentence. We talked a little bit about this last week. He utters this simple sentence, follow me. And Matthew's life, future, character, heart, and an entire eternity are transformed instantly. He was changed from a useless, bound up, lawless, demonized, angry, materialistic tax collector to an apostle of God who is able to write the book of Matthew. In a single sentence, follow me, Jesus' ministry has the ability to convert. We also see Jesus' ministry was loving to the lost. Lost people were drawn to Jesus. They, they, they liked him. They, even those that weren't converted, even those that weren't changed like Matthew was changed, they liked being around Jesus because he was loving to the lost. Uh, which, by the way, the more you become like Jesus, the more attractive you'll become to sinners. The more you become like Pharisees, the more hated by sinners you'll be. It's a very interesting thought. Furthermore, Jesus was concerned for the hurting. They were drawn to him. By the way, that's not to say uh, that uh, when you're like Jesus, Jesus, not every sinner obviously like Jesus, because, because some sinners are so set in their ways they don't want to hear the truth. And so that's not what I'm talking about. But I'm just saying 
uh, that uh, if you're more like the Pharisee, you'll be hated because of your judgmentalism. Jesus was never accused of being judgmental. Uh, he loved the, the lost. Anyway, let's go back. Jesus was concerned for the hurting. They, they were drawn to him because they sensed his sympathy. He, he had just healed this man from, this, from the bed of affliction, from this, this paralytic. Uh, now he was concerned for Matthew. He didn't just see a man who was lost in his sin and was filled with materialism. He, he sees past all of that and he sees the hurt in this, in this man's life. And the, the people around Jesus were drawn to him because of his concern for the healing, healing excuse me, for the hurting. Not so the Pharisees. Look at verse 11. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your, your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? See, Jesus was able to convert, but these Pharisees, they were nothing but gossips causing dissension. The whole point of that question is not really to get an answer. It's to try to cause dissension. They go to Jesus' disciples and they're hoping to sow the seed of discord. They're hoping to sow a seed of doubt in the disciples' minds. Why does your master sit down with sinners and tax collectors and awful, nasty people like that? I mean, is this really the kind of person you want to be following? Now, obviously, they don't, they don't really want an answer. They, they don't want an answer at all. What do they want to do? They want to plant the seed of doubt in the mind of the disciples. They are gossipers. They are causing dissension. They are spreading rumors. And let me tell you, it's still a problem in the church today. Uh, uh, gossip is, is one of the most underrated sins and most overlooked sins in the church world today because it causes dissension and disunity and it breaks apart instead of bringing together. It is, it is, it is, uh, it is like murder because it is, it is murdering somebody else's name and reputation. It's a horrible, horrible thing. But secondly, in verse 11, not only do you see that they were, they were trying to cause this dissension and disunity, but they're also filled with condemnation. You know, they, they didn't, they didn't, the question doesn't say, why is Jesus concerned with these poor hurting people? Why is Jesus ministering to these lost people? Why is Jesus burdened for the unconverted and the unregenerate? Why is Jesus spending time with, that, that he might spend with other people, with these people here that seem to need it the most? Now that's not what they say. They say, why is Jesus eating with these tax collectors and sinners? Why is he eating with these nasty people? They're filled with condemnation. And finally, they, they were concerned with, uh, for self. And they were concerned for their reputation. Now, Jesus is not concerned about his reputation. He's concerned for the hurting. He's not worried about people uh, seeing him with the sinners and the tax collectors. We know that because that's, he spent a lot of time with them. In fact, it was prophesied that Jesus would be numbered among the lost, you know, the drunkards and the gluttons. He, he, he was even crucified between two thieves. And I, I can't help but think that as Jesus hung on the cross, even then he said, you, you know, this is where I belong. I've spent three years with these kind of people. I still belong here. And even then, even hanging on the cross, half of them still get converted. You know, one, one on one side got converted and the one on the left was filled with anger and hate and bitterness. But still, even, even then, Jesus' Jesus', Jesus is concern for the lost and the hurting goes outside the fellowship of Israel. And the scribes and the Pharisees stood at the foot of the cross saying, He saved others. Let, let him save himself. But look at the contrast. Then in verses 9 through 11, Jesus is able to convert the Pharisees' caused dissension. Jesus loving the lost, the Pharisees filled with condemnation. Jesus concerned for the hurting, the Pharisees concerned for self and reputation. Well, we wouldn't want to, we wouldn't, wouldn't have, want to have anything to do with people like that. So, somebody might think we're like them if we hang out with them. We would never hang around with people like that. We wouldn't sit down at a meal with those lost people. We don't want anything to do with them at all. Now look at verses 14 and 15. We, we see a contrast in a very beautiful way here. Now, I'm going to say this. This portion, we're going to read it. 
This part is not about Pharisees. This part, section is about the disciples of John the Baptist. Uh, however, their actions in this seg segment were probably a little more like the Pharisees. So I'm going to include them in this study, even though they weren't Pharisees. Uh, but, but we're going to put them in here at this point in time. But Matthew 9, 14 and 15. Then the disciples of John, we're talking about John the Baptist here. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees? First of all, that's a very odd combination, isn't it? You know, the, the disciples of John the Baptist and the Pharisees. Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. You know, Jesus is filled with joy, and he wants his disciples to be filled with joy. But these people, grieving over the loss of John the Baptist, are filled with self-righteousness and self-pity. We fast, your disciples don't. We're grieving for John the Baptist. Your disciples are having a good time. I mean, John just died. They're having a good time. They're in there talking, laughing, and eating, and, and we're sitting out here in a huff. Look at the contrast. You, you, you sense behind the words of these disciples of John the Baptist, the, these disciples of this great prophet, you sense that there's something in the spirit of the prophet missing in the words and spirit of his disciples at this moment in time. Jesus filled with joy. The disciples of John the Baptist and, the, and, and along with the Pharisees filled with self-righteousness. And Jesus was feasting on relationship. He, he wants to be with us. He wants, there's an old song and you, you just almost never hear it outside of a funeral any, anymore. But you'll know the chorus. You know the chorus. I guarantee that. But it says, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Now, now that doesn't mean that nobody else has ever enjoyed that le the level of intimacy with God that the author has had, the writer of the song. It, it, it means that there is nobody else in the world that has the kind of relationship with the songwriter that God has with the songwriter. He's saying the, 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 the joy that we share as we tear there, nobody else has known that kind of relationship with me. Only God has that kind of relationship with me. It, it means that no other relationships has about it the, the profound spiritual intimacy that the relationship between a human being and God has. I heard Dr. Mark Rutland one time, he told about a class in in hymnology that he had to take in seminary. And in that class, the professor would not allow them to sing that song. He, he hated that song. He despised it. And finally, one day, Dr. Rutland just got up the nerve and asked him, he, he said, why do you hate that song so much? What, what's wrong with it? And, he, and the, the professor said, well, it's, it's schmaltzy, it's sentimental, it's mushy. And he said, I just, I don't even know anybody that feels that way about God. And Dr. Rutland just sort of meekly said, well, I do. I, I really do. And the professor, professor wouldn't believe him at, at all. He thought Dr. Rutland was trying to pull a con on him. But you know, I wonder if you can remember times when maybe you walked alone with God, times of intimacy. Maybe you're out on a beach or you're walking along a stream or you're out in the country or just even walking in your neighborhood and you're, you just get away from everything and everyone and you just walk in this beautiful intimacy with God and there's that closeness there. But you know what? Jesus not only wants us to feast on that, but he feasts on that too. He loves fellowship with his bride. The disciples of John, filled with self-pity and with self-righteousness, become isolated and insulated, and they cannot enjoy relationships. Listen to this. Here is a great rule. It's one of, the, one of the laws of the universe. I believe this with all my heart. Here it is. You cannot really enjoy your own wound, your own wound. You cannot really enjoy your own wound and a relationship with anybody else at the same time. You cannot really enjoy it. You, you, know, you know what's good? Self-pity is good, isn't it? 
I mean, we like that. Yeah, we, uh, uh, self-pity is really fun, don't you think? I mean, we just, we eat that up. Anybody here ever indulge in self-pity before? Let me see your hand. I want to know. I want, I want to know. I just want to know if I'm not the only one. Uh, it, it feels good, too. It satisfies the flesh. Makes us feel like, oh, you know, she was wrong about that. You know, if, if she'd just been in church on Sunday and heard my message, she'd have never said that. You know, boy, my... My children just treat me so awful. Well, nobody understands me. They just don't understand my pain. Nobody cares about poor old me. Just feels good to our flesh. There's, I mean, it's really taking hold in our culture. We're such a, we have such a victim, victim culture where we, we want to be the victim. It just oozes down through your pores, and you, you, just, you can really get into it. I, I'm, I'm, however, listen to this. Self-pity always cuts you off from other people. Self-pity always cuts you off from other people. You cannot really enjoy your own wound and enjoy relationships with anybody else at the same time. It is a completely isolating experience. You know, young people, I, I, I wish young people would hear this and understand this. I find that young people in particular today seem to indulge in, in self-pity at an alarming rate. You know, they, they, they get all alone. They get all, all romantic about self-pity. They wallow in it and turn on some old lonely song. And then they create some TikTok of how bad their life is and shed a few fake tears on there to try to get a lot of people to... To, to, to feel sorry for them and they get into a dark room and lie on their bed staring at the ceiling and they feed it. But the, the only way you can feed self-pity is alone. And that's what I hear in the disciples of John the Baptist. We, we fast all the time. John's gone. John's not with us anymore. We fast. But your disciples, they, they look like they're having a fiesta. They look like they're having a party all the time. They're, they're not morose like us. And Jesus said, how can they be morose? How can they be sad? They're with me and I'm here. We're, we're having a party. There's a uh, Mexican chorus that I've never heard translated into English. Um, but it says that, oh, I'm going to try to say it. And I'm gonna, if you, anybody speaks Spanish, I know I'm going to butcher this. But it says, it says, hay una fiesta continuamente en mí. You know what that means? It, 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 I'm not going to give you the literal translation because, because it doesn't fit very well, but it translates to this. There's always a party going on in me. Isn't that great? It, it's good, but you know, here's the thing. You can't have a party and be filled with self-pity and self-righteousness at the same time. You can't live in the joy of the Lord and the joy of the moment and the joy of your relationship with Jesus and be focusing on in self-pity on your own life because... Because you have to have self-pity uh, 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 and self-righteousness all alone. And, it, and it's hard to have a party alone, at least for most of us. You see the next level of contrast between Jesus and the Pharisees in verses uh, 18 to 35. This is what it says. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house, incidentally, I do want to say this, that uh, this story, we usually read this story uh, from Luke's account, because he gives us a lot more detail. Uh, he tells us the, about the, the name of the guy. His name is, J is Jairus, and, and, uh, and he t gives, tells us some other things about the event. But we're studying Matthew, so I wanted to read it from Matthew's account. But verse 22, And when Jesus came to, to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion. Now, th these are hired mourners. You, you pay them. And they come and fill the house with the sounds of death. They weep and wail. They are professional mourners. They get paid to act sad and fill the house with sadness. Now, now some mourners that are there are going to be genuine because some there are going to be actual family and friends. But many of them are professional mourners. And they, 
They still do this in Middle Eastern nations. Verse 24, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went through that district. And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame throughout all the district. As they were going away, behold, a demon possessed, excuse me, demon, uh, uh, demon oppressed is what it says in the ESV, man, uh, who was mute, was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisee said, He cast out demons by the prince of demons. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogue and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. Now let's look at some of the contrasts here. We see the, the, the woman who is healed by touching the hem of his garment. When that happens, it is a matter of the power of life flow. What, what is killing this woman? Her life is flowing out in her blood. The blood is, is life to us. What heals her? Jesus' life flows in. And as if Jesus is continuing that same manifestation of ministry, he goes to the ruler's house, identified as Jairus in Luke's account, and he goes to that ruler's house and raises his daughter from, from the dead. The ministry of life. Jesus has the ministry of life. What's the Pharisee's ministry? The ministry of death. Jesus has the ministry of bringing sight, but the Pharisees made themselves blind. They, they can see Jesus healing. They see these things. They, they see him casting out demons. They see him, uh, uh, the deliverance that comes. They see the results of it, and they do not deny that those things happen. However, seeing all of those things, they go blind to the reality of what it really means. I mean, this guy's been healed, and this guy's been delivered. This guy can see, and this guy can talk. And, and, and here's a girl who's been raised from the dead. And here's another woman who had an abnormal flow of blood who's healed in a moment by merely touching the hem of his garment. Add all of that up, and what does that mean? Well, the conclusion is obvious, isn't it? This guy must be from the devil. That's, it's, it's, I find it almost funny. That when you put all of those things in context, all the things that they're seeing, all these miracles, all these tremendous things that Jesus is doing, and they come to the conclusion that, oh, he's from the devil. I mean, it's, it's almost comical. I mean, you have to make yourself blind to see that. It, it, it must mean then that these men, while Jesus is call, causing others to see, they're making themselves blind. Jesus' ministry is the ministry of freedom from bondage. The Pharisees' ministry is the ministry of bondage. They are binding people up with the law. Jesus is setting them free. And in fact, he, 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 he talked about that in other places, he talks about the burdens that they put on people. That's what their ministry was. Jesus' ministry is a ministry that gives expression to silence. And I'm going to say a little bit about that, what I mean by that. There, there is a great misunderstanding, first of all, in some elements of the church that this passage of Scripture is teaching that all those who are speechless are demonized. That is not at all what this passage is about. There, there are those who pray for the deaf to be healed only by believing that there is a spirit that has rendered them deaf. Now, in the New Testament, there are accounts of those who are rendered deaf by a spirit. In the New Testament, there are accounts of those who cannot speak because they are possessed by demons. However, that does not mean that everybody or even most people or even a great many people have this problem. N nevertheless, Jesus' ministry is a ministry of giving expression to silence. Let me, let me put it like this. I have known men who in all their lives, all their marriages, all their years as a father have never been able to say, I love you, to their wives or to their children 
until they find the touch of Jesus on their hearts and on their lives and, the, and they're touched by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then God brings expression out of silence. Whether that is by saying it or whether it's by writing a love letter for the first time in his self-centered, silent life, when Jesus brings forth that expression out of silence, that is consistent with the character and nature of Jesus' ministry. However, while Jesus' ministry uh, gives expression to silence, the Pharisees' ministry is the ministry that shuts people up. The ministry that binds them. Ministry that wants to close things off and end relationships. Now I want to look at just a couple more of these areas of contrast. Turn to chapter 12, if you will. This is a passage uh, with which you are very, very familiar. I, I won't read the entire passage, but, but in verses 1 through 8, um, th this is the passage where Jesus, uh, his disciples, Jesus and his disciples, you remember they're walking through this grain field. And, and it's on the Sabbath day, and they pick the grain and begin to eat. You remember that story? First of all, let's stop there. What's wrong with that picture? A, they shouldn't be walking anywhere. It's the Sabbath. B, they shouldn't be doing the work of picking grain. And C, having picked it, they shouldn't be doing the work of preparing food on the Sabbath. If you, if you don't already have the food prepared before the Sabbath, then don't eat. That's the law, as interpreted by the Pharisees. Don't walk past the Sabbath day journey. They could only walk a certain short distance on a Sabbath day. Don't work to pick food on the Sabbath and don't prepare food on the Sabbath. So Jesus and his disciples have broken the law in the sight of the Pharisees three times. And the Pharisees are furious as usual. Then look at verse 2. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. You know the law, Jesus. They're breaking the law. And he, Jesus, said to them, have you not read? And then down in verse 5, again, he says, or have you not read? Now, now what is Jesus trying to say then? Th this is really kind of a shocking thing to say to the Pharisees. Have you not read? And he says it twice. Well, listen, the Pharisees' whole point is to let you know they have read. That's the whole point of what they're saying. We've read the law, and your disciples are doing what's against the law. Yes, we've read the law. And Jesus says to them twice, haven't, haven't you ever read the Bible? That's what he said to them. I imagine, if you will, the, the most literal-minded, strict constructionist, fundamentalist, scholarly seminary professor in the entire world arguing with a arguing a point of a biblical law with some ignorant backwoods pentecostal hick and then the pentecostal hick says to him why doctor such and such haven't you ever read in the bible where it says what do you think the professor's response is going to be he's going to say you're asking me if i've read the bible but I've read the Bible more than you've ever read anything. You're asking me if I've read the Bible? And, but Jesus twice, in two or three sentences, asks, haven't you ever read? Haven't you ever read? The problem is that they have read, but not read. They'd seen, but not really seen. They'd heard but not really heard. They'd observed, but they had not understood. They, they did know the story of David eating the bread of the presence in the temple. They, they, they knew that story, but Jesus' point is they didn't get it. Jesus is making the point that they have idolized the Bible and missed the point. Similar to what he said to them in another place where where Jesus says, uh, uh, you, you've read the, the scriptures and the scriptures talk about me and yet you deny me. He's saying you're, you're reading it, but you're missing the point. This should be a wake-up call to anybody that studies the Bible, by the way. 
They, they, had, they had idolized the Bible and missed the point. They had idolized the Sabbath and missed the point. They had idolized even the temple and missed the point. Look at verse 6. I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. Now Jesus, just right here in this moment, made a statement that could get him crucified or stoned to death for blasphemy right on the spot. Every time I study the gospel accounts again, particularly the, the account of Matthew, I, I, I see again and when I read it that, that it is not amazing that Jesus was crucified at the end of three years. What is amazing is that he managed to live three years before he was crucified because of the shocking statements he would make. He looks them right straight in the eye and he says, you've never read the Bible twice. Haven't you ever read the Bible? He, 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 says you, he says you didn't understand what you did read. Furthermore, you idolized the Bible and missed what the Bible is really talking about. And third, you've idolized the temple and missed him who owns the temple. I am greater than the temple. That one statement is the most shocking statement of all in, in all of the first 12 chapters of the book of Matthew to me. Something greater than the temple is here. There is one here standing in this place who is greater than the temple. My, my friends, listen, listen to me for just a moment. There are people still today in the body of Christ, in the, in the company of Christians, after 2,000 years of reading and studying and preaching and teaching the Bible, both Old and New Testament, who love the law. They are stupefied and uncomprehending because of their own legalism. They have idolized the scripture and missed the Jesus of the Bibles, Bible. They, they have idolized the Sabbath and missed the fact that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. They idolized temples and buildings and have missed the point entirely. That this is not about buildings. It's just not. There's a... Uh, little Methodist church in Georgia that some time ago just began to grow tremendously and it just, it just took off like a shot. They, they got a pastor that was full of the Holy Spirit, miracle number one, uh, but, and it just took off. They, they, just, they just began to grow like crazy. Finally, they were having multiple services on Sunday morning and, and every weekend having multiple services and they realized they needed to build a new sanctuary. Well, they, they wanted to build the sanctuary. It makes sense. It should be. And they wanted to build the sanctuary right in the middle of the lot and have the parking all around it so there'd be uh, easy access from the parking lot and sh the shortest walking distance as possible for everybody uh, to the building. But no. What was in the middle of the lot? Anybody have a guess? What's, what's right in the middle of the lot? The little old white framed building that got built there in 1913. This, my dear friends, should not be touched because that was where grandma worshiped. The, the idea was eventually brought forward to, to debate in that little church to knock down the old white church building and build a new church. At this point in time, they had 2,300 members in a sanctuary that would seat 200. They're, they're going to build a new building, but, but God forbid that they build it where the old church house was. So they, they couldn't get it passed, so they, they had to spend thousands of dollars buying the lots behind the white frame building. So now there is a brand new thousand seat sanctuary that is sitting on the back of the lot and right in the middle of the parking lot is a little old falling down white frame church in the middle of a parking lot of a thousand seat auditorium. You know, I, you just want to go in there and put a sign up on the, on the edge of the property that says, there is one here in this place that is greater than the temple. Or, or is there? You know, every now and again, we get caught up in all kinds of Bible arguments. Somebody will, will inevitably pound their fist on the table and say, I take the Bible literally. I take the Bible literally. Well, yes, that's great. But do you take it seriously? 
It's far more important to take the Bible seriously than it is to take it literally. You, you can take it literally and literally miss Jesus. You can, you, 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 however, if you, if you take it seriously, it will convict you and lead you into the ministry of life. In, in Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7, I just, I just want to throw this out there for a moment, but you remember the place in Acts chapter 7, where Stephen is arrested and he's on trial for his life and they ask him if he'd like to make a defense. Now, now people uh, teaching it will talk about the defense of Stephen. However, the truth is he makes no defense. Stephen makes no defense whatsoever. He is not concerned with saving his life. Nothing in the, in the sermon that, that follows the arrest of Stephen, Stephen has anything to do with defense. It, it's almost as if he says to himself, what can I say here that will get me killed? When you read it, I mean, it's almost as if he said, let me think now, what's the nail I can pound into, the, the final nail I can pound into my coffin? Can somebody hand me a hammer here? He is determined here really to speak to these people that which, what, which God wants him to say. Well, Acts chapter 7 is one of the longest sermons recorded in the entire New Testament uh, Acts chapter 7 verses 2 through 43 here uh, here's a man who is under under arrest for breaking the law and for blaspheming the temple and they are they're going to stone him to death and they say to him what do you have to say for yourself well he takes 41 verses to talk about the history of Jewish resistance to the leadership of the Holy Spirit he talks about how Abraham resisted God. He talks about how, how the patriarchs resisted God. He talks about how the people in Israel rejected Moses. And he turns from there to the lighthearted subject in verses 44 through 50 that the temple is not indispensable to a relationship with God. And then finally, he says that of all the generations that have ever lived, that the generation, generation in which he was living, the people he was speaking to were the guiltiest of all of rejecting God and missing the whole point. He says, he says, you have the law, but you've missed Jesus. You have the temple, but you've missed Jesus. Just as your fathers despised and rejected his prophets, you've despised and rejected his son, and you've missed the whole point. But Jesus' ministry was a ministry of goodness, life, liberty, love, freedom, and truth. The Pharisees' ministry was a ministry of law. Now, I want to show you one passage of Scripture, two verses back to back, that show this probably better than any verses in chapters 9 through 12. It's Matthew 12, verses 14 and 15. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. It's, it's always amazed me how the Pharisees will get all up in arms with Jesus about breaking the law. And they get angry and they accuse him of breaking the law. And then in the very next sentence, they're getting off into a room somewhere to plot murder. Is that amazing to you? That they're caught up in the religious laws, but they're willing to break one of the original Ten Commandments. Verse 13, Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all. See, theirs was a council of death and destruction, but Jesus was having a council of life and healing. Theirs was a, a, a council of, of backroom politics, a smoke-filled chamber where death is being plotted on a secret agenda, but Jesus is only secret agenda was to get alone with God and, and people came to him in droves and his ministry of life overflowed in deeds of love and healing. And, you know, this is a kingdom issue. This is an, an issue of a kingdom whose subjects, who, whose children are to be like their king, who, who, who are to minister in the power of the kingdom, which is the Holy Spirit. It's an issue of a tree bearing the same kind of fruit as the tree. Look at verse 50 of the 12th chapter. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. This is about new relationships, a new unity, a new life, a, a, a new love. What, what is the body of Christ? What is the church? It is the healed who are becoming healers. It is the saved who are becoming life savers. It is the delivered who go forth to set men free from bondage. It is the forgiven who extend grace. It's the fruit 
that's like the tree from which it comes. You know, inside the visible church today, we see the same distinction happening over and over and over again. A, um, a young man who was lost, an, an alcoholic, went to a men's retreat with, his, with a pastor in his town, and he was gloriously saved, delivered, baptized in the Holy Spirit. He went back to that church, and the joy of the Lord was just all over the young man's face. His wife was just, just got totally turned on to God. Their, their home became a place of ministry. The, they started a Bible study for other young couples. It was just a real joy to see God working in that young couple. Well, about a year later, they had a layman's ministry Sunday, and the pastor asked him if he would give his testimony in church. Well, he got finished with his testimony, and the thing is, the, the only thing he, he ever knew about church was what he had seen his pastor do, because he, he had never been in church in his life until he received uh, deliverance from alcoholism, and he was just doing what he had seen. So when he had finished giving his testimony, he, he stepped around to the front of the, of the pulpit, just as he had seen his pastor do a hundred times, and he, he said, if you want the Lord Jesus to come into, into your heart, then why don't you just stand up right where you are, make your way to the front, and, and I, I want to pray with you to receive Christ as Savior. And right at that moment, this elderly lady, about three rows from the back of the church, jumped to her feet and stomped her foot, and she said, you just stop right there, Charles. Just stop right there. She said, who do you think you are to give an altar call in this church? Who do you think you are to, to pray with anybody? Who do you think you are to give ministry in this church? She, she said, I remember a year and a half ago, you were as drunk as Cooter Brown on the back porch of your own house. You just stop right there. If there's an altar call to be given in this church, you let the pastor give it. Phariseeism. Phariseeism, legalism, small-minded, judgmental, critical, unloving, judgmentalism. It stinks of death. It is not of God. It is not of the kingdom. It is not Christian. It is not biblical. It is not like Jesus. That's the Pharisees. That's the Pharisees. My dear friends, I, I want to say to you that it, it is better to be like Jesus and be crucified than to be like the Pharisees and win the power struggle in this life. The Pharisees won. I mean, on, in earthly terms. They're the ones that nailed him up. Jesus lost when it comes to earthly terms. The power struggle that was going on between them. He was the one that was nailed up. The Pharisees sort of came out on top. But the only thing was, Jesus set people free. He unbound people. Uh, forget about the law. This is not about law. You, you, you know, people say, you don't go to church on the right day. Well, you know what? I know of a pastor in Costa Rica that has a worship service every morning, seven days a week from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock in the morning. And he has, he has 3,500 people there seven days a week from 7 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock in the morning. Well, let me ask you, what's the Sabbath in Costa Rica? Every day. <laughs> every day is. It's not about keeping the Sabbath. So, somebody's got some little old, tiny-minded, legalistic interpretation of the Scripture. and They say, you ought not be in doing ministry. You had a problem in your marriage once. You, you got divorced. You got remarried. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. And, 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 and Paul, honestly, he looks at it and he says, yeah, yeah. And such were some of you. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. This is not about the law. You know, you know, Jesus said of Lazarus, as, Lazarus as, after he called him forth from the grave, he said, unbind him and let him go. Unbind him and let him go. Lazarus, Lazarus raised up from the dead. After that, he was a thorn in the side of the Pharisees. Did you know he was the only other person besides Jesus in all of the New Testament that the Pharisees conspired to kill? It was Lazarus. Because he had been raised and unbound by the prince of life. And when you are raised and unbound by the prince of life, you become a thorn in the side of every Pharisee out there. He had been raised and unbound by the prince of life who gave men liberty, who gave expression from silence, who gave life from death and gave grace instead of law. 
And, and the Pharisees kept trying to stuff him back in that grave. Think about this. They wanted to kill him. In other words, they're saying, we don't really like Lazarus. We don't like him at all. We wish he was still dead. That's what they wished. His, his vitality embarrassed them. His life convicted them of, of their death. And his liberty shows their legalism to be the hollow mockery of the gospel that it really is. Well, let me, let me close with this. A poor family, nothing but a bunch of lazy hillbillies who wouldn't tend their farm, they wouldn't work, and they had a little calf, malnourished, weak, pitiful little thing that they kept pinned up in a little six-by-six six pen. It grew so malnourished that it was just wobbly-legged. Its eyes were bulging out from malnutrition. Its belly was starving from, was bulging out from starvation, excuse me. And they, they just kept it pinned up in that little six by six pen. They just gave it enough food to keep it alive. My little old calf standing there, barely able to stand, legs wobbling, belly all swollen, eyes bulging. The hair on its hide was stiff and br brittle from the lack of nourishment. Well, just across the pasture, there was a rich family filled with bounty and plenty. They had a little pet calf that the kids had cut out from the herd. It was, they, they, they never intended to slaughter this, this calf. The calf was nothing more than a pet. The kids treated it more like a dog. They, they loved on it. They kissed it. and In fact, it even slept on the back porch at night. One day that pet calf was of that rich family with, with, with happy children came band, bounding across the pasture, you know, jumping on all four hooves, uh, uh, budding everything in sight, you know, full of strength and vitality and joy. It, it had run and butt this tree and then it run and, and butt the fence post. It was just bounding up and down, running back and forth across the, the field, just having the time of his life. And that little old bound up, pitiful, starving calf in its six by six pen looked through the fence and, and you know what he said about that other calf? He said, he's crazy. He said, he must be crazy jumping around like that. That's not real life. Something's wrong with that calf. Look at him. He, he's got a demon or something jumping around like that, running and budding thing, trees and things. He said, real life is wobbly-legged, swollen-bellied, blurry-eyed malnutrition pinned up in a six-by-six six cattle pen. You know what? We live at the level of subnormal so long that normal Christianity begins to look like a monster to us. I wonder if the living Jesus came bursting in, filled with life and vitality, such joy that, that real men like to be with him and tell jokes and laugh and sit down at the table and have a fiesta and eat tacos until 2 o'clock in the morning and play some guitar music and just have a good time and laugh. If Jesus came bursting onto the stage of our lives, I wonder how many of us were would turn out to be Pharisees after all. I wonder how many would say, look at that, acting happy and giddy in church. <laughs> look at them, hanging around with the people that are divorced. Some of those people are winos. Really, some of those people are really evil things, like lawyers. Look at them acting like they have the right to be happy. Well, I wonder how many of us would turn out to be Pharisees after all. If we ever really saw the good, happy, free, loving, life-giving Jesus. I don't want to be a Pharisee, do you? Or a Sadducee, because I have to say it. Because they were sad, you see. Here's what I want to do in closing. I want everybody to just stand right where you are. And I want you just from right, right where you are, just to stretch your hands out over, over the, every section of the pews in this place. And, and, and we're going to pray together for our service on Sunday morning. We're, we're going to pray that God would just set off a, a, a Holy Spirit time bomb. A big joke on any sourpusses that walk into this place on Sunday morning. You know, a love bomb that's going to go off in their mean faces on Sunday morning. And, and that people are actually absolutely going to be loved into the kingdom of God on Sunday. I want you to pray with me that there will be a baptism of love and a, and a move of the Holy Spirit in this place on Sunday morning. 
Pray over every section of pews. Just stretch your hand out and pray. You don't have to touch every one of them. The Holy Spirit can, can do that on his own. But, but believe that there's going to be a downpour of love and a move of God over every section of people. And, and, and I want you to, 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 to bind the spirit of the Pharisee, that, that the spirit of judgment would be bound up and that love would be released in this place on Sunday. Would you do that? Let's just do that as we close and ask God to, 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 to bind that spirit of Pharisee and let the, the ministry of Jesus flow freely in this place on Sunday. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we pray for every pew and the people that are going to be sitting in every pew. I pray, God, that you would draw them into your presence, that you would bring people into this place. And God, that you would set off a time bomb of your spirit, that, that your love would explode in this place, that your life would explode in this place, that the, that, the, that the spirit of Phariseeism, the spirit of judgmentalism would be bound, Lord God, and that the ministry of Jesus would be set free to move freely, that you would set people free, that you would bring healing, that you would bring restoration, that you would, you would bring life, that you would, you would uh, just do the work that only you can do, Lord God. And Lord, we just believe that you're going to do this. And we agree together in this place. And your word says that there's power in agreement. And we agree together, Lord, that you will move, not just this Sunday, God, but, but every Sunday, every time we gather together, I pray that Jesus would be free to move and that the love of God would invade our lives, that you invade our souls, that you would, you would so saturate us with your love, God, that when we talk with people on Sunday, it wouldn't be us, but God, that the, the love of God would flow through us and touch lives, love people to the kingdom of God this Sunday, we pray, and use us as tools in your hands. And we give you praise for it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.